episode 92, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format through expert analysis. Today's expert is Dr. Tori Seppa. She's a psychiatrist out in California in private practice, but she's an extensive history in clinical medicine, both in the public and private sector, and she tells a very interesting story about maintenance of certification, its problems, and how she almost made it onto her specialty board. And then we discuss COVID, or coronavirus, and the toll it places on those who suffer from depression and anxiety in today's society, and her comparison to the state of shortage of hospital beds in the wake of COVID for non-psychiatric patients is somewhat of a struggle that she deals with every day. As always, detailed show notes for the show can be found at theparadox.com slash 092. That's P-R-A-D-O-C-S. If you don't yet subscribe to the show, please be sure to subscribe on that podcast player right now. There's absolutely no reason not to because it's free. And speaking of free, this show isn't free to produce. So if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash theparadox. There you can become a patron supporter with a monthly contribution, a pledge of as little as $2 a month to keep this show on the air and receive my undying gratitude. Today's interview is a little bit longer, so I'm going to keep this introduction short. So without further ado, Dr. Tori Seppa and the MOC Shakedown. Enjoy. Well, hey, this is Eric Larson. I'm here with Dr. Tori Seppa. She's a psychiatrist in Pasadena, California, home of the uh, Rose Bowl Parade, <laughs> which is all I know about Pasadena outside of sunny, sunny Southern California. And we're going to talk a little bit today about something totally different. We're not going to talk about COVID, at least initially, but we're going to talk about MOC. And I've done a number of episodes in this. And for those of you who are recent listeners, uh, this is something that I have not delved into for quite a while because it's just been so much other stuff we've discussed. But MOC is short for maintenance certification. And Dr. Seppa wrote a good piece about this, which will be linked in the show notes page, which you can find at theparadox.com slash 092. And uh, let's start the discussion first, Dr. Seppa, and just give us a little background about how you ended up in psychiatry and sort of your career arc, I guess, up to this point. Sure. Um, actually, I began my career in uh, family medicine. Um, and I should say, even then, I, I'm a uh, late bloomer. I started med school almost at the age of 30. Uh, so I started in journalism. I was a writer first. I um, was an editor at a magazine called Ms. Magazine um, in New York City. Oh, yeah. And uh, kind of <clears throat> stumbled upon medical school uh, late in life um, and uh, started <clears throat> in uh, family medicine, actually. Um, uh, and how I came to psychiatry was not because there was anything wrong at all with family medicine. Um, more that when I was choosing a specialty, every, all I heard was, uh, there's a shortage of primary care physicians. There's a shortage of primary care physicians and does, and as such, I chose primary care. And then when I was in residency, um, I realized I hadn't seen a single psychiatrist in my uh, entire, during my entire internship. In fact, I wouldn't know where to find one to do for a consultation. Um, and I realized there's a tremendous shortage of psychiatrists. Um, so <clears throat> I, I really started to think uh, more about uh, psychiatry um, and a family member <clears throat> of my own actually had taken uh, her life, my cousin, my aunt actually, um, oh. upon immigrating to the United States. And like most people who complete suicide, it was preventable um, had she had uh, the right care. So I thought a lot about that and a position opened up, <clears throat> a second year position opened up in the area and I applied. My 
pro, you know, changing specialties is a lot like getting a divorce. Um, everyone <laughs> right. has to be, everyone has to be on the same page. You really have to really have, uh, you know, has to be really well thought out. And my program was um, supportive. Every, and I added a lot of time. Uh, it wasn't an easy thing to do. In the end, I'm happy. I, I'm a hybrid. Um, it was the right decision um, because uh, psychiatry is something that uh, is, is underrepresented and is about life and death. And there's a lot of work to do in psychiatry. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think we're all compelled to go to medical school to begin with because we want to help people. And certainly, you had a personal, you know, reason that 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 specialty probably called to you more than you know others would. And you know, it's a perfectly understandable sort of reaction to things. That's, I mean, that's why we're in medicine, right? I mean, I've talked about that a number of times to show that the number one satisfier for physicians is a personal relationship with patients. And when you can have affect people so profoundly, probably why it drew you to family medicine initially too, right? I mean, the, those personal relationships. And so, so had you finished like a year or two in family medicine is before no, you switched? I finished, um, I was in my second year. Okay. So you sort of finished a transitional year essentially, which sort of psychiatry I imagine yes. is also kind of, you do psychiatry, but you mm -hmm. also do intro medicine and probably yes, some you, other things. Right. Like, you have to yeah. do a first year um, in usually it's med and medicine and peds. Um, yeah. uh, we do 30% neurology. Um, and uh, I, so I, I was in my second year. I, so I didn't get any credit for that year. Sure. And then I started as a PGY too. So um, all in all, I wish I could have done a dual program. Uh, there not, one did not exist. Life goes on. I think, Having that foundation still in family medicine has been um, incredibly helpful because I treat a very particular population. I'm an HIV psychiatrist and also something called reproductive psychiatrist. So I treat peripartum patients. Um, so it's been useful still. Uh, you know, don't regret it. The time spent um, was well worth it. We can do a lot to educate, I think, our medical students about what psychiatry is, which is about medicine and life and death. And I think I just didn't get that, that exposure at the time. And that's critical. I think that I hope that we were changing that. Yeah. Well, it's, and I think it's with, when you pick your specialties in medicine, I think most people don't realize this who aren't physicians. Like you really are either, you may have some prior experience in life. Yeah. Most of us don't have a lot outside of seeing, you know, a pediatrician or someone. And right. then, then the other exposure is while you're in clinical rotations in your third year, yeah. usually. And that's a pretty small window. Then you've got internships. And, yep. and so if you don't happen to stumble upon what you find interesting and you kind of run into it later, you're sort of yep. left with a dilemma. Uh, for me, it was mm -hmm. anesthesia. I just happened to have, we're, we have required rotations where I went trained at mm -hmm. University of Iowa. And it just was my mm -hmm. beginning of my fourth year. And so I kind of just reworked everything because I thought it was pretty fun. Mm -hmm. I, the funny thing, of course, is that my wife is a pediatrician. And when I came home and told her that I was going to do anesthesia, she's, just laughed because she thought I was joking because she thought it was the most boring rotation. <laughs> She'd had some meds to it. Um, so I guess before going a little further, I, I've not heard of HIV psychiatry. Does it mean you just specialize in people okay. with HIV or what does that mean exactly? That's a good good question. Technically speaking, there is a newer subspecialty that's actually under one of the uh, board certifications and that would be called consult liaison, which is really med site, if you will. Okay. Um, it's the person, it's newer and, you know, a lot of people, including myself, could have grandfathered in uh, and taken the board certification with without doing the formal fellowship, which that time period passed. Now you have to do a formal fellowship. Right. Or there is an, an sub sub category of that is very particular group of patients that are HIV positive. They're are not a lot of people who treat have treated HIV positive patients for an extended period of time. I think in LA County, there are two of us. One is at LA County USC where I did residency. And I know myself, um, I work one day a week at one of the, the kind of the oldest HIV clinic here in LA County, I guess, based on uh, kind of your end, the number of Sure. patients and years that you've spent. I come from working in corrections for five years. So being in corrections just by default um, exposes you to a large number, a higher per percentage of patients who are going to have hep C and HIV concurrently. And as such, 
that patient population with their neuropsych has a unique neuropsychiatric presentation. And so it's probably a very uh, small percentage of psychiatrists nationally who are com or who special subspecialize in this. It's certainly not a board certification, but it is very nuanced because it is it's a very unique patient population. How it's practiced is also important. I'm integrated into the HIV clinic, which I believe is how um, interdisciplinary care involving psychiatry has been shown to be the most effective, which is you don't have 1,400 people who are HIV positive go and look for 1,400 psychiatrists. Right. You have one psychiatrist in the clinic who is working with the three infectious disease doctors and sees the patients. And so we're all connected. The patients are connected with the physicians. So it's seamless. Outcomes are better. Evidence shows that patients have higher compliance with their um, antiretrovirals. It's also easier for the psychiatrist because you know, we can um, address a lot of questions with the team, a, team, a true team-based care. So I believe in the model as well. So I, I think that that's a very unique way of approaching uh, interdisciplinary care. It's not practiced. Um, very readily in the community that way. I think um, a lot of systems, everyone wants a psychiatrist. Nobody wants to pay for psychiatry is how I see it. It's like everybody, it's like instead of buying a car, everyone wants to just use Uber, right? So everyone just kind of hires a contractor here and there, and then everyone complains why there's no continuity of care. It's like, well, if you actually bring someone in and do it this way, which is evidence-based, you will have cost savings, better outcome, and care that is truly integrative, not just in words and rhetorically speaking, but in a, um, in a system model. So sure. HIV psychiatry is, I think, the most tangible way that I've seen that I, that, that can be applied. HIV psychiatry is very intriguing, and I, I, I really deeply enjoy it. I enjoy the systems aspect, like I said, and also the care in general is one of one of the most um, fulfilling. Sure. I mean, you can see you can see tangible results with people who are more compliant with the medications. They are better, right? I think huge difference. Huge yeah, difference. and I think we see this in in a not that I spend any time in chronic pain, but certainly mm -hmm. chronic pain with interdisciplinary yeah. yep. clinics where you have the psychiatric or psychological yep. component, physical therapy, and all those sorts of things that go along with mm -hmm. the just you know the procedural aspect of the pain control. Um, so that actually kind of that's exactly right. That actually kind of brings us into your piece a little bit because you know you mentioned a couple of times yeah. different board certifications, sub certifications. When it comes to mm -hmm. board certifications, the ABMS is the American Board of Medical Specialties. That's sort of the overriding um, arm, I guess, of, I guess, medicine. I wouldn't, it's not anyway specific. Yes, and they have yes. all these subspecialty boards of the different specialties. So mm -hmm. anesthesia, pediatrics, uh, psychiatry, family medicine, internal medicine. Yes. Uh, and then those specialties have their own boards. Now, these are separate from professional societies, which I think we'll get to in just a moment. But, uh, and so you have, you finish your residency, you do some sort of testing, whether it's oral or written or some combination. Uh, I know surgeons have, you know, case reviews and things like that that they have to do. Uh, and then once you pass that, you are board certified. Prior to 1980, I think it was, or so, you were certified mm -hmm. for life. That changed. And that, then it became time limited, which means that you have to take a test or something every 10 years. 1994 for psychiatry, actually. Okay. And, and that's probably, so it was pretty late. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and the same is pretty much the case with all the specialties. However, yeah. as of like, I don't know, 20 years ago, probably less than that, mm -hmm. the, the certification process changed. Not only became time limited requiring a, an occasional test that most people mm -hmm. pass because it made it fairly easy. It suddenly radically changed, right? I mean, I feel like mm -hmm. in your piece, I think I'll let you go into mm -hmm. what you how you feel about the process, but this maintenance certification is entirely different animal than the initial certification. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about your feeling on MOC, which is short for maintenance certification? Standardization is something that I should I should preface this by saying that standardization is very important in medicine and is something that I also value because 
it's something that fundamentally we're guided by. And as physicians, we follow evidence-based medicine. One can't just deviate and do things uh, willy-nilly because that's just not what we signed up for. We are fundamentally a profession that has signed on to standardization. I mean, we started off that way with the MCAT. I mean, there's nothing kind of more compelling yeah. than the standardization that is the most rigorous, perhaps, um, standardization exam you can think of. So if you were really not on board, that would be the screening to take you out, right? So I believe very much in maintaining a process that holds us to a standard where we are keeping our individual skill set up to date so that we are as a profession, all of us, whether we are anesthesiologists or psychiatrists or pediatricians, we all fundamentally represent medicine. We want to, each of us represents each other, right? We want to all be able to, there's not a lot of physicians, there's 740,000 according to the AMA who are licensed in the US and have MPI numbers. We all want to be able to represent a standard that is safe, that is one that we can be proud of in terms of this is up to date, this person has met the new, you know, what we consider to be the most rigorous standard. So I'm all for that. And I think otherwise, you know, I certainly wouldn't have taken the exam in the first part. And the exam, of course, for psychiatry is after the four year four year residency, we take for general psychiatry, it's a we have a three part oral exam, um, which is done in residency with and it's actually you don't know when it's gonna happen. Your uh, department chooses an actual patient oh. the day of and you're not informed. It's actually kind of for psychiatry it's a little stressful, right? Yeah, so I bet. Psychiatry patients aren't exactly predictable, right? So <laughs> By the very nature, yes. It can be in the ER, it can be in an inpatient unit. I mean, most of the time it is, actually. And you are then told, this is going to be one of your exams. And so you have three of those. You cannot sit for your written exam until you pass those. And that's actually the greatest barrier for eligibility for the written exam is a very low pass rate on the oral exam. Sure. Historically. So once you pass that and you sit for the written exam, great. Fantastic. You take the written exam and the written, our written exam is 30% pure neurology, which because it's the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, that's fine. That's usually the hardest component of it. And then you agree to take it again in 10 years. No problem. You should be able to take it again. You should take it in 10 years. And if you can't pass in 10 years, then you've got to do some, you know, you didn't keep up, right? Mm -hmm. Then something is wrong. I signed up for that. And I was very much in agreement that that's critical for somebody who's practicing in a specialty. What I did not even understand at the time, actually, when I signed up, when I when this was all happening was what exactly mock met when I got my first bill, uh, which was an annual bill. Yep. I was like, what is this for exactly? It was like just $500, right? Annually. Like what? Did, and I, I remember writing them or emailing, like I paid for my task, which was several thousand dollars. I passed. They're like, this is just to maintain it. Tell us that, you know, you're participating in maintenance. Why would you, I need to pay for that? And then, and on top of that, by the way, at least in psychiatry, we need to purchase tests yes. from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology through the APA for self-assessment, which really bothers me because I think that not very meaningful, actually, when we are, if anybody actually was practicing in the real world, they would know that we are assessed constantly. I mean, we're assessed at work. We're assessed by patients through patient satisfaction service. We're assessed online. Anybody can go and Google me and see like how many assessments we've had. We're assessed nonstop. I mean, there's nothing but assessments going on. For me to pay, by the way, 
to assess myself because I really have time to do this. This is exactly what I want to do, right? Yeah. Is adding multiple insults to injury and then pay the $500 per year, which is $5,000 at the end of 10 years. Sure. It's yeah. not insignificant. I didn't pay it for three years because it was just too annoying. And then <sighs> guess what happened? My little board certified changed to not participating in maintenance of certification right. online. And I remember thinking, that's very aggravating because I took this exam, I passed, and now, because I didn't pay this arbitrary, in my opinion, arbitrary fee, they have determined or made it publicly look like there's something wrong with my knowledge base, which is problematic. It's conniving. And that's when I felt like this is a shakedown. Yeah, right. I'm going to pay you now. I'm going to go ahead and pay you the $1,500 because I don't want it to look like my knowledge base is lower than it would be if I paid the $1,500. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the story you, you, you tell there is very similar to other specialties, whether it's pediatrics, I talk specifically about what my wife goes through, what uh, anesthesia is, that you have this, what you say arbitrary, this fee to basically just have them say that you are maintaining the certification. I mean, I don't know what psychiatry is specifically, but for anesthesia every year, you have to say, yes, I have a license. Yes, I yes. got no like criminal you know, um, mm -hmm. charges against me. But that's you know also just self-reported. <laughs> and then, right. and then um, you are... You're expected to, you're expected to do a test, and then we, there are also new educational components that we have, and I know that pediatrics had a lot that they keep adding in. And so, well, you're sort of like your 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 statement initially was like, well, I just I assumed that the the process was such that you take the test and then you repeat it every ten years to basically make sure you have a, a fund and a mastery of psychiatry in general. Uh, but now you're there's all this other stuff that keeps coming at you every year and and plus a, a fee that it's hard to understand what value you're getting from that aside from them as a computer just putting in you know that you make this much money, you know that that you paid how can they justify the fee and the thing is like what i don't understand is there's one i think this group of they they really have missed the boat on the group that they are supposed to be servicing this group doesn't need to be micromanaged historically right right yeah. so especially at this phase of their life we have completed everything yeah. now you're going to micromanage us yeah we didn't get this level of micromanagement even through residency or med school you know it's up to you to take your steps and pass step one step two step three nobody was saying turn in this module nobody did that nobody it was right. up to you you didn't pass you didn't pass it's your fault now i can't even keep up actually frankly with the requirement they're so bizarre there's a disconnect between the american board of at least for psychiatry and neurology views as what a clinical psychiatrist in practice um has time for mm -hmm. is what is relevant to that person as i believe they are considering a very small slice of psychiatrists which would be those maybe in academic and academic medicine and even then academic medicine from 20 years ago <laughs> it seems like we are grown ups if we can't pass that test in 10 years that's on us, our bad, waste of money. I don't need somebody to micromanage me and then to, I guess, justify that $500 by micromanaging. Yeah. I get, that can, that's the only sense I can make of it. My husband is, people actually pursued additional board certifications. <clears throat> so child and adolescent psychiatry is six years postgraduate work, one less than neurosurgery. It's a lot of work yeah. um, and it's a full, another test a lot of people don't want to take that i mean can you imagine they have to keep up now like two of these oh, yeah. like full mocks and people are like forget it like i'm there's no way i'm gonna do both yeah. you know my husband has two certifications for sure he's not gonna do both i think that's what's discouraging right because we shouldn't be discouraged to maintain 
you know, from, because of the administrative and cost burden, which essentially is the reason why, not because of the test. He's not burdened by taking the test. He's burdened by paying another $5,000 just for the maintenance. Well, it requires studying. I mean, this is part of the problem. I have my, uh, I have a friend whose wife is a hematology oncologist and of course mm -hmm. they're all medicine trained beforehand. So she's triple board certified mm -hmm. essentially, right? Because, mm -hmm. and so she is almost perpetually in a, in a testing pattern because she's always testing mm -hmm. for one of her three tests and she's always in the, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of crazy that she's always involved in this. It's almost like an extra administrative hurdle, which is, I mean, mine yeah. seems kind of minimal compared to hers. And I know that I talked to lots of physicians who have problems at MOC. And one of the things is that you're, as a physician, you are generally extremely good student. Uh, you are a self-motivated, self-learner. That's sort of how you got to be a physician, generally speaking, yeah. right? You weren't out partying when you were 22. You were actually right. hitting the books or whatever. Uh, although you were out, you know, dallying with MS Mag Miss Magazine, right? So <laughs> you had a more exciting, <laughs> but uh, for most rights, but uh, I mean, obviously you're very good too, what you're doing. So uh, then you're, then you go through residency and, and then you get through all that, you master the, whatever the, the specialty is. And then you're sort yeah. of expected, like you said, you're almost treated more like a child before that you still have to maintain your specialty mastery by with your yeah. search um, cmes through your state um, licensing board yeah although even if they didn't have those required people would still do those things because you have to be able to continue doing what you're doing as yes. medication changes and whatever and right. then and then i find i find the thing that's most concerning is that's not obvious to people who are outside the industry there is the there's the board your specialty board and then there's your specialty society and your specialty society Mine would be the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Yours is the American Association of Psychiatrists, right? And yeah. And American Psychiatric oh, Association. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Uh, and your the expectation is that that society works to protect you uh, in you know represent you in D.C. Let's say for you know billing reasons and to make sure that you know yeah. you're valued. But the American Academy is the anesthesia. Their your society is one of the most proactive. Well, we are, uh, and it, but mm -hmm. partly that's because we've been they were so bad. I think a while ago. Be I would like to join them. Well, I actually. you wouldn't like because, if I could because it's no different. They're all the same in the sense, and I'll tell you why. I mean, my impression is yeah. is that they are um, in this sort of arena where I think you have almost universal disdain towards MOC yep. from physicians. The specialist societies are inclusion, right? I mean, they have. Yep. They they look at revenue source, and most organizations say the revenue. Well, comes the from, APA sells the self assessment. It's exactly yeah. my point, right? I mean, most uh, societies, and I'll just speak for the medical society in Michigan. It gets its revenue from membership. Well, uh, you're right. It, and so th that's a struggle for them because if they lose members, they lose revenue. They have no alternative right. means for medical uh, for revenue. You look at the AMA. Right. AMA doesn't care if they have any members because they have a huge revenue source from the CPT code books, right? But guess what? The AMA here's a little something. So I, I am an APA member and I'm an AMA member. Um, I, I have more problems with the smaller the subspecialty group. I mean the specialty groups because I believe that in general it's hurt us to be divided into our little groups sure. because we just, we don't, we're so few that that's not work. Fundamentally, we have the same problems, same issues, same concerns. And yet there's a thousand different ways we're arguing it and we're losing a lot of, we've, we're not doing that great when it comes to having a say in healthcare, having, uh, we're losing more and more autonomy. We are in and a great deal of that, I think, is because we've depended a great deal on our identity as our special in our specialty. But really, you know, when you look at other allied healthcare professionals, they are doing very well and they identify very strongly with their fundamental profession like nursing. Nursing is nursing. Nursing is not ICU nursing or pediatric nursing right. when they go to Congress. Nursing is nursing, and nursing has top management position in hospitals. Right. We lose a lot when it, in congressional legislative battles as well. We're not as organized. We're not as prepared. And it's not nursing's fault. <laughs> it's because we're kind of coming to the table from and it's from this side, this side, this side. Everyone has, you know, it's like it's like this 
Yet that fundamentally, actually, we all have the same concerns. And so um, when we look at one of the main, the AMA is not perfect by any means, but fundamentally, they are on our side when it comes to this particular issue with mock. I know this from an important example, which I don't know if you know, the AMA nominated me to be their candidate for a board position on the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology's board of directors. I was honored. Look, I'm pretty transparent about where I stand, right? Um, And I'm a pretty outspoken, I'm a physician advocate, I'm a patient advocate. I don't have a great deal in terms of politically speaking, I'm willing to work within an organization, including the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, but it's pretty clear that um, where I come from. Now I have leadership experience because I used to be a chief psychiatrist at the California Department of Corrections. So I think the AMA knew that I met the criteria in terms of being able to meet their physician's criteria. They nominated me and the thinking was, from what I heard at least, that very unusual to be nominated by the AMA and for a board not to confirm the nomination. Yeah. I was not confirmed. And well, I mean, after reading your piece, I can see why they would they would not. I mean, because you're challenging them, right? Right. I was not confirmed. I wrote, the, I have to tell you, I wrote that piece, though, after but I had made, you know, I obviously had written things like this before, you know, and I felt that they wrote me a letter. I mean, my the letter they wrote me was, you are qualified for the position. And we hope that you stay involved and approach this position again in the future or something like that. I think that I did pick somebody who is in academic medicine. Mm -hmm. My main reason I wrote this officially afterwards was because I tried actually to go about this with as working within the system. Look, they had the opportunity to have someone who represents the actual general psychiatrist, right? And neurologist who is not in academic medicine, but you know, frontline psychiatrist, right? They, that opportunity existed. Somebody who qualified based on all of their requirements and was nominated by the AMA. So I know that they, I gave it my a fair shot. I was willing to. It was the sacrifice for me because it take it was would take a few months out of the year. Um, in Chicago, but I was willing to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, uh, not to say that, you know, I don't know, I'm sure the person they chose is very well qualified and amazing. But I can only say that I'm the person who would have probably been more challenging to have, right? So that's not what they what they were open to. And that tells me that it's not a board that is looking to have representation of, of their contingency in their board of directors. Yeah, and that probably could be said for just about every specialty board because, again, the, the resistance to and I only speak from uh, the, uh, my participation in Michigan State Medical Society, and I, it doesn't matter what someone's politics are, whether they're very left, very right, somewhere in the middle. Uh, it doesn't matter what specialty they are, pretty much. I mean, ER is a little bit more in favor, but in general— it's like probably 90, 95% of physicians are really hostile to MOC or some aspect of it that really, really gets in their skin. And there's really nothing in medicine <laughs> you can find that sort of consensus on. And and yet you don't see really any response from these boards outside of this year where they said, oh, well, you know, was, I guess it's not important to do all these things because you're busy with COVID, right? But um, but uh, outside of this year, there's been uh, very little responsiveness from, from the boards. But you know, it, it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward because at some point there's a there's a breaking point and and I think you know you're there's three lawsuits right, right? there are some lawsuits um, and uh, the osteopathic board sort of got taken down a rung earlier um, a year ago. Mm-hmm. In your piece, you also talked about the other the human aspect and the toll it takes on outside of the financial aspects, yeah. right? I mean, I think we talk about mm-hmm. burnout. I mean, do you think that's a, something that you see, mm-hmm. see that you see think is real as far as mm-hmm. the administrative burden? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I run a group for physicians um, on Facebook, but it's a, it's a closed group just for physicians, and it's about 3,300, 400 um, doctors, and it's essentially a safe space for doctors to provide peer-to-peer support to each other because that's an intervention that's actually evidence-based and free. Uh, you don't have to do yoga. You don't have to stretch. <laughs> those don't work. You can be as flexible as you want. It's actually not your fault that you're burnt out. There's nothing wrong with you. You are resilient enough. That's not the problem. Um, that's part of what I'm really trying to undo is this notion that physicians have burnout syndrome because something is missing in them or something is wrong with them and they need coaching or they need yoga or they need to meditate or become mindful. No, 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 no. That's not the problem. We know exactly what the top three causes of physician burnout are every single year. They're identified. uh, Loss of autonomy, number one. Number two, increasing administrative burdens. Okay. So let's see. How does mock fit in with those two? Loss of autonomy. Do I feel a loss of autonomy when I am micromanaged for 10 years about with mock? Yes, I do. And the administrative burden. So when physicians are spending extra time, so the EMR has changed our life. We know that physicians spend, this is a study that was sponsored by JAMA, two hours on the electronic medical record system for every hour of face-to-face time. And a lot of that is now spent at home after the kids go to sleep or after, you know, whatever is done, they're in bed, pajama time charting, right? Yeah. So we are really drained. I mean, it's not just even charting the note, it's the inbox, the refills, you know, constant. And now it's like, oh, we have an app. So there's like a constant ding, 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 ding. It's like, did you get this message? Did you get that? This patient did this. Those are all administrative burdens, right? So add to that now an additional, very particular type of CMEs and et cetera that they want you to do. But not only that, how, how they want you to report it. It's like this way and that way, you know, I can be, you know, I'll do CMEs. Just trust me. I'm a big girl. <laughs> I'll take that test. I'll report how many I did. I mean, I can track my own CMEs and keep track of them. But the additional burden of tracking something as though we don't even do that for residents. We don't do that for medical students, yeah, right. you know. So it is one more thing and not a minor thing, actually, to add. So we know that physicians are in crisis. They have two times the suicide rate of the general population. Right. We can't, there's never going to be a way we can link burnout to suicide because there's no elegant way of designing a study to do that. But we know physicians have, there's a 50% burnout rate, burnout syndrome is what it's called actually for physicians. And that suicide rate keeps going up for physicians. So we have adding administrative burden to a group that doesn't need it and taking away more autonomy from a group that doesn't need it is problematic in my opinion, you know, Um, and it's, you know, cutting your nose off in in spite of your face from what I see. Yeah. And I've spoken to You can't get blood from a rock. (laughs) I've, I've spoken to Pam Weibel. Uh, and Dr. Weibel runs a pretty extensive su- physician suicide support line. I mean, she's sort of unofficially become a spokesperson to protect physicians when it comes to that sort of issue. And and she also believes a lot of the, exactly what you said, the loss of autonomy, which is, I think, without mm-hmm. a doubt, MOC contributes to it. It's not certainly the only thing, but it's... No, no, it's not the only thing. It, but there's no... Suicide, by the way, not just for... There's never, and this is really important, not never is there one thing that yeah, leads right. to and I'm, I'm a psychiatrist and suicide is my you know is our fifth vital sign right so I, I i spend every single day thinking about suicide preventing suicide i think about suicide 
nonstop for the last 17 years, right? So there's never one thing, even when someone writes a note, even when everyone says it was one thing, there's never one thing, yeah, right. never, ever, ever one thing. You got to look at the big picture and you got to look at someone's risk factors. And then you got to look at a demographics risk factors. Mm-hmm. And there even the demographics risk factor. So physicians as a demographic have risk factors. And one of the risk factors for this demographic that we can look at is one is they don't get help actually. So 85% of physicians who complete suicide were not seeing a psychiatrist. And this particular female physicians have four times the risk, which is unusual because females in the general population have a lower risk of suicide completion. Having children is not protective for physicians, um, whereas having children is protective for the Mm -hmm. general population. And we know that administrative burdens, charting, being kind of tethered to all the burden administrative tasks is something that has exponentially increased over the last decade, as has the physician suicide rate. Loss of autonomy has also gone down. We can't say there's a cause and effect. All we can say is this is some an association we see. Yeah, right. Because you can never have a control group for this sort of thing, obviously. So we can never control for that. I mean, we can, it, it, yeah, suicide study, there's no way. We always have just associations and risk factors, you know, and that's true for really every population. That probably wouldn't make it through the IRB, <laughs> that study. Never, never. Uh, Suic- studies are always done in retrospect. Yeah, and I feel like when it comes to the, the administrative burden, and especially when it comes to, well, I've mentioned this a number of times in my show, which you're probably not mm-hmm. too aware of my I, we had a son pass away two years ago from a car accident uh, he was 14 i'm sorry to hear that thanks and um and i feel like right now uh with dealing <laughs> with all the stuff going on with covid with all the talk of de- dying and death and you know you turn on cnn it's like you know there's a daily death count on the side and it certainly seems like there's a lot more uh, it's a lot more difficult for people I, i'm guessing especially people who are dealing with grief and their family you know it's just it's just been mm-hmm. tougher. And I know talking to other people who've dealt with it as well, since we've talked to other fam- parents who've lost children and mm-hmm. they feel the same way. And it's sort of, you know, I, I only imagine in you and psychiatry are seeing a lot more of that too recently, right? I mean, I, is that the case? So you've, would you say the last few months, it's been a lot more challenging for people, even though they may not have any specific reason to be, you know, fearing yes, absolutely. COVID. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. So I would say that from the first, from March, right from March about 20th to 25th. How I would put it is I feel still, but I started to feel like I was running an inpatient psychiatric hospital for three, 400 people remotely, but by myself. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of people decompensated. I don't have anywhere to put them. And I have a lot of geriatric patients. Some of them are in nursing homes. Some of them are at home. I've been make, I was making home visits, cleaning out refrigerators. I mean, I couldn't even get, at the beginning, I couldn't even get uh, home health for some patients. People definitely who were vulnerable decompensated. And the worst part about it, though, is that this is largely a group that is already invisible. Um, right. in society. So when they're invisible and they become sick, or I cannot um, make them visible at all. Uh, and in fact, what made me tremendously, I, almost, I felt very angry actually for a good part of it. And I wrote an article for Kevin MD and you know, I still have it. He, I chose, you know, I was, I was very on the fence about running about him publishing it because I wasn't sure if it was my best piece uh but I wrote it it it, it was about suicide during this time period and this is this was how I presented it which was at the time and even now I think so this we have had six about seven thousand deaths since I I believe maybe March in California right from COVID. Okay. I think that's the tally is 7,000, right? So suicide is the second leading cause of death for adolescents. Sure. In the United Outside, States. Next to trauma, right? Would be the number one. Next to trauma. Right. Yeah. yeah. And 
It is the 10th leading cause of death overall. It is the fourth leading cause of death for women between the ages of 35 and 55. We lose 170 people a day. It's preventable. In California? This is a prevent, no, in, in the okay. United States. Yeah, okay. but, but this is a preventable death, right? Like totally preventable. 170 people die in the United States every single day. Um, and that's based on last year's data, though. I don't even have this year's data. I'm right. really waiting. The CDC calculates it every year based on what I've been. I've, I feel like um, it's been really frustrating for me because the beginning of the first month or so, I heard a lot of my colleagues very, very, I get it. They were very concerned about, I'm not going to have enough beds for my patients. What am I going to do? You know, let me tell you something. I never have enough beds for my patients <laughs> because there are yeah. only 33,000 psychiatric beds in the whole country. So what psychiatrists do every single day in an ER is dis that we discontinue holds that shouldn't be discontinued because we don't have beds. So what we do is we come up with plans knowing that this person might kill themselves. Okay. And so I don't have a bed ever for my patients. Yeah. And I, I go through that psychiatrist do live with that every day. I don't have a patient. And I feel like, how is it that doesn't rank as high as somebody who feel, you know, who comes in who might have an infectious disease and not to say that I don't think an infectious disease is relevant or important, but why is it that a 15 year old who has very good risk of dying a preventable death isn't every day we send them home because we don't have beds. Yeah. But why is that not relevant? We do this every single day. I have thousands, I've done this a thousand times in the last three years, maybe a thousand, you know, and that made me incredibly angry that the world stops. Okay. Stops, literally stops. But it had never stopped when we lose 170 people a day, most of them young people, by the way, yeah. um, from a preventable death. No, there is no urgency to make more beds for those people. It, this is always a tricky thing to talk about when COVID, because, you know, as a health professional, you don't want to be someone who minimizes the, the importance of COVID. It's obviously, you know, a terrible thing, pandemic, mm -hmm. and it's causing all sorts of problems. But And then to so, suddenly say, well, you know, there are consequences for our social mm -hmm. isolation and lockdown. I mean, people say, well, mm -hmm. how many extra suicides are there? Well, that doesn't really answer the question of, you know, the human suffering that goes in, the you know, right. right? I mean, it's not just amount of a death toll one or the other and like what's the best, right. it's like a utilitarian sort of argument. I mean, do you use life years? Do you use actual lives? I, um, right. And it, it's many people made the argument initially with COVID, like, well, the, the main problem with COVID is that it's totally new, right? If it was something... If suicide yeah. had never happened and all of a sudden the suicide was happening, well, then I think people probably, people probably start paying a lot more attention. But everyone knows that, oh, suicide's mm -hmm. been around a long time since, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. And so, like, well, just one of those things. And, you know, and yeah. you look at the revenue and the, the reimbursement for the, for doing things and what's how advent, you know, how much can you generate yeah. by having a bed holding someone who probably is not insured, has poor insurance mm -hmm. or poor payment, right? I mean, that's the, one of the big problems. And then you had, on top of that, like, I know in the state of Michigan, we have certificate of need laws that prevent the psychiatric beds from being opened up because yeah. if, because hospitals say, well, we don't. Yeah. So there's right. all this. So there's all this, you know, there are all these sorts of things, but it, it's not a priority, like you said. And, and so you've got no. people who are people just don't pay attention to it. And it, and no. in a situation like now, you, there's no oxygen to get any attention to it at this point at no. all. Right. There is none. And, and it frustrates me because this is these are people's sons, daughters, mothers, wives, and people care once it's in their backyard and their family. And then, right. then everyone's like, how come there's no hospital bed for, the, for my world? I'm like, yes, I know. I literally, I remember I had this discussion on Facebook with another physician who's a good friend of mine. And, you know, we, we agreed to disagree where she's a search, she's a urologist. And I've known her since we were interns, actually. Um, and I said, you know, I deal with this every day. There's when there's not there are not enough beds to stop uh, to to keep people who are need psychiatric beds and they're at great risk of dying. 
And she said, well, I don't think this is the same. This is different. And I said, why do you think? Because they're choosing to be very depressed. Is that the, <laughs> is it volitional? You know, and I think that part of what I wonder, and that a great deal of what I do in my job is to try to educate people and their families is that your brain is an organ that's connected to the rest of your body. The same blood flows through it. There's no such thing as behavioral health. That's I'm not actually speaking of mock. I don't actually, I'm not board certified by the American board of behavioral health. Um, that's a made up term by insurance companies um, <laughs> to relegate psychiatrists actually to um, a second tier where we got we get reimbursed less and so in fact the american board of psychiatry and neurology if they really want to make my 500 dollars a year worthwhile what they should do is and get that term taken away i the worst part is i pay all this money but i'm called a behavioral health provider and yeah. i'm credentialed as a behavioral health provider under most insurance plans I, the last two years, the Millman report showed that psychiatrists are reimbursed for the 99205 to 99215, the physician time-based codes, 20% less than PCPs, right? That keeps psychiatrists out of insurance plans. So only 20% of psychiatrists are a panel. So we can't even complain about a shortage of psychiatrists when we're not using 80% of them in insurance plans. This works out great. For insurance plans because they don't have to then pay. Psychiatry was the most out-of-network used specialty, more than plastic surgery and dermatology in the last two years. Insurance plans love that. They keep calling it behavioral health. That means it's volitional. It's your behavior. You don't really, it's not medical. You know, it's opti- if you really need someone, you know, you can pay the extra fee. That doesn't help patients, especially when suicide rates were so high that it caused the life expectancy in 2018 to go backwards for the first time since World War II. Right. Something is wrong, right? And the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, they want my money, I should at least make sure that I'm credentialed as a psychiatrist, not a behavioral health provider. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> yeah. um, sort of off topic, but when you you wrote for MS Magazine, is it was it called is it Ms. called Miss Magazine? Magazine, uh-huh. Magazine, right? Yeah, a uh, Miss MS. It was started Ms., by Gloria right. Steinem. Uh, how do you think that has changed? I mean, obviously, you were an, a non traditional student in the sense that you didn't start straight out of college yes. into medical school. But outside of that, what what do you feel feel you're writing? And I can also, by the way, I can tell just from reading your pieces that you have experience writing. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thanks. What What do you think that how do you think that's important for you, your career? And mm-hmm. would you say that that's an important skill to try and acquire if you're a physician, even, you know, you're not going to be writing stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think writing is, so I, I feel that I'm a better writer now than I, because I found, I think I have more confidence in my voice now than I did sure. okay. um, when I was at Ms. I think when I was at Ms. I think Ms. was, so big compared to me magazine that was started by Gloria Steinem. I felt very lucky to be hired as an editor. I paid my dues. I mean, I started as an unpaid intern. I didn't feel like I was a very, to, to write, you have to really feel as though you have to have experience in life, you know, and sure. I don't think I had enough experience to say much. When I look back, I was a better editor than I was a writer. I could edit, which mean I could help other people write. Um, But I was not a very good writer. When I look back, I just didn't have confidence, I think, um, in what I wanted to say, because I didn't really have enough of a perspective. I did write the health column, which is how I ended up being interested in medicine. Back at that at that time, which was um, the mid 90s, there was this explosion in uh, research uh, um, related to women's health. And I, I remember when I was reporting about it in the health column, um, thinking, this is just so exciting to be able to communicate this to the public, this, this amazing information, you know. And at some point, decided to take a biology class uh, to understand some of a little bit more about, you know, the fa- have a foundation in science a little bit. Um, 
And I remember then at that point feeling like, you no, know, it would be really interesting to be able to connect a little bit more directly with, you know, the public as opposed to never knowing these people who read these articles. And that how it began uh, was, you know, tr trying to starting with disseminating information about health and feeling like health journalism was really the most important type of journalism. It, had I not gone, gone to medical school, I would have just focused on health journalism. And then having gone to medical school, then I felt like I was sublimating this path in terms of connecting with health and information and kind of knowledge about health to people directly. Then, you know, over, it's been about only a couple years that I've started writing again and found that I have something to say. <laughs> you know, I have a voice. Right. And it's like, oh, wait a second. I used to write it. And now I have something to say. And usually when I write, it's like, I honestly, it's like, I just, it takes, it's like five minutes. I just sit down and I write. And never would that have happened 20 years ago. But now it's like, I have I know what I want to say and I just say it. I have a perspective and experience and, and it's clearer now. You know, sure. there's less self editing and less self consciousness, you know. Makes sense. Well, Dr. Seppa, thank you so much for the conversation about Thank MOC. you for oh, having my me. My pleasure. Uh, you can find Dr. Seppa at on Twitter at Tori Seppa M D. This is that and links to the article and a couple other things you've written and things we discussed in the show will all be linked at the show notes page at theparadox.com slash 092. So again, again, Dr. Seppa, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.